Hello students. Today I'm going to talk to you about part three, post-World War II America. This section talks about in detail the social, economic, cultural, and political transformation of the United States after World War II. I am going to recap some aspects of the Cold War, so I'm doing it to refresh your memory. And of course, you're going to be answering questions. All right, this political cartoon represents the domino theory. And that's what Harry Truman came up with. The domino theory states that if one country falls to communism, border countries will fall to communism as well. And we learned that communism is an economic system where the government controls most aspects of society, particularly the economy. There's not a lot of freedom of choice, free markets, and free opportunities under communism. In this, pic, in this photograph, or it's not a photograph, this political cartoon right here, you have the Viet Cong, which represents the aggressor in the Vietnam War who tried to spread communism, and he's pushing these dominoes down to make sure they become communists. And these are countries like Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, Burma, India, Bangladesh. Here is an American soldier trying to stop that from happening. And that's one of the reasons why the United States became involved in Korean War, Vietnam War, Cuban Missile Crisis, because it stopped the spread of communism, that threat of communism spreading to areas that are democratic and free. So that's what that is. This picture is another aspect of the Cold War, particularly the Vietnam War and how the American people were divided during that time. Um, you had two sides, the Hawks right here, and the Hawks were for war, and there were for American intervention in Vietnam. And then on the right-hand side right here are the Doves. They were against the war, they are for peace. They believed that Americans should not be involved in South Asia, stopping the spread of communism because there's too much death and destruction and waste of resources and cruelty. So they were they were against that. There are a lot of protests around the country. You've seen um, the movie um, Forrest Gump that, that's based on the time period around the Vietnam War. Hawks versus Doves. That's Cuban Missile Crisis. Here's a political cartoon that depicts the rivalry between the Soviet Union and the U.S. Also, the fight over arms, nuclear weapons. John F. Kennedy and of the United States and Nikita Khrushchev of the Soviet Union, they're arm wrestling, and they each have their finger near the button to set off a nuke. So it's that fight over world domination, that rivalry over ideology and world domination, communism versus democracy, freedom versus um, no freedom, uh, dictatorship, versus uh, free elections, free elected leaders. So they're both sitting on a nuclear weapon. It could go off. This is another picture uh, slide about the divide um, during the Vietnam War and about the Cold War. Young men burn draft cards for the government to protest the Vietnam War. Um, a lot of people burned American flags. Uh, a lot of people had uh, disruptive uh, protests around the country to show they were against the Vietnam War. And they're burning flags. Um, I'm sorry, they're burning draft cards in this picture right here. Uh, this picture also represents the divide in America during the Vietnam War. The, this is a picture of some high school students showing a black armband, which represents their protest against the Vietnam War. They were suspended from school for doing that, but they took their case to the Supreme Court, and the, and the Supreme Court upheld what they did. They said what they did was fine because uh, what they did was protected by the First Amendment, freedom of speech, freedom of expression. So they had the right to wear a black wristband with a peace sign on it, representing they were against the war. All right, another aspect during this time was the collapse of communism in Europe. So communism fell in the Soviet Union and in Eastern Europe. 
the reason why was because um, the Soviet Union spent so much money, so many resources on building up its military to a point where it, string, it strangled their economy, where they didn't have enough money to build up roads and schools and highways and libraries. A lot of people became poor in the Soviet Union. And so uh, that mindset made communism decline. That's not the only thing, but that's the most important reason why communism fell in Europe. A lot of people got mad and a lot of people got aspirations to protest against communist governments because under communism, you got to remember, you don't have a lot of freedom. You don't have a lot of liberties. You don't have a say so in your government. You don't have freedom of religion. You don't have freedom of the press, uh, freedom of speech, freedom to petition. That You don't have a lot of that under communism. You have a dictator. So three things you need to remember that represents the collapse of communism in Europe. Uh, number one, it says a breakup of the Soviet Union into independent countries. And if you look at this map down here, um, the biggest part of the Soviet Union was called Russia. And then over time, um, other countries broke away from the Soviet Union and became their own countries. They became democratic. They picked their leaders. They had freedoms and they had elections. They had things that they did um, to show that they were democratic. You have countries like Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, um, Turkmenistan, and Albania, excuse me, Armenia, and um, some words I can't pronounce, the Ukraine, Belarus, Lithuania, um, Estonia, Latvia, all those countries broke away from the Soviet Union after uh, during the collapse of communism. Even Russia became democratic. They voted for their own leaders. Number two, the destruction of the Berlin Wall. We learned that the Berlin Wall became the ultimate symbol of the Cold War in Europe. It represented Soviet oppression. And the Berlin Wall lasted for 26 years, and it fell down in 1989. It literally and figuratively came down. I remember watching uh, the news when I was in the seventh grade. I was happy. Yay, these people are free now. They don't have this wall that's going to keep them in and separate them from their families and loved ones. So that Berlin Wall was a symbol of oppression and the uh, and just the fact you're not free. Somebody's telling you what to do all the time and you don't, you don't have basic rights. Some of the Cold War. And the third important thing was the reunification of Germany in 1990. We had learned that Germany was divided up into two parts. East Germany, which was communist, not free. West Germany, which was democratic and free. So over time, and in 1990, both of those countries came together as one. Both of those countries came together as one whole Germany. Germany is democratic, and it is an ally of the United States. Yay, Germany. It's free now. All right. All right, this part right here, I'm going to talk about some changes in the U.S., in the world between the end of World War II and then the present, in terms of economics, social, and political factors. A lot of changes happened in America for the better. We became a great and strong country after World War II. Um, I'm going to read some things. It says we had a strong economy, which means we have a healthy job market. Unemployment was like 3 to 4%. We had increased productivity. We made a lot of products, a lot of wash machines, dryers. Stoves, microwaves, TVs, cars, ready-made clothes. So we made a lot of products made in America. We're a very strong country. We still are today. In the interstate highway system, and that was pushed and promoted by President Dwight D. Eisenhower in the 1950s because of the Cold War. We have more interstates now because of him. Because we had to transport uh, military goods and personnel and equipment all around the country because of the Cold War. And you've heard of Interstate 81 and Interstate 95 and uh, a lot of neat interstates. Uh, it also led to increase of suburbs and cities getting bigger. So the interstate highway system. Greater investment in education. What that means is people stayed in school longer. People didn't drop out. People got their GED. Um, some people who served in World War II went back to school, get an education. As you see in the stamp right here, of a military veteran getting his GED, studying for it. You had the baby boom, which led to changing demographics. 
A lot of mil a lot of soldiers came home from the war and they got married and they started families. So if you're a baby boomer, you're born between 1946 and like 1964. So that's a period of about 18 years there. So 76 million babies were born in the United States between 1946 and 1964. Um, and that made a population spike up. Um, evolving role of women. Um, expected to play a supporting role in the family while increasingly working outside the home. A lot of women went back to the home. You had less rosy derivatives. You had men return back to the factories. But women also went out there still again because of technology, a strong economy, and uh, you know there's more money in the economy for them uh, to gain. So they went out into the workforce again, bigger numbers. Um, another important person arrived on the scene after World War II. She was also she also played a big role during World War II. Um, in her husband's administration. Um, her name was Eleanor Roosevelt. And as you know, she was the first lady and wife of the great Franklin D. Roosevelt. She played a big role in expanding human rights abroad. Uh, a lot of countries around the world at this time um, didn't have a lot of freedoms. They didn't have a lot of opportunities for its citizens. And American people like Eleanor Roosevelt wanted to make sure those countries treated their citizens freely and uh, with kindness and fairness. She was concerned about civil rights and women's rights. She found an organization called UNICEF. And you have to do some research about that. So Eleanor Roosevelt, a great first lady and great lady who pushed for expanding human rights. Uh, another thing about this time period was the African Americans' aspiration for civil, excuse me, Americans' aspiration for equal opportunities. Um, African Americans served in World War II and they came home and they want to be treated free. And that gave way to the Civil Rights Movement, which we're going to talk about later. Um, some major aspects. Uh, you have some new policies that came about after World War II that made America great, made America strong and more fair. Policies and programs expanding educational and employment opportunities. Um, number one says the GI Bill of Rights gave educational, housing, and employment benefits to veterans. That was signed into law by FDR in like 1945. So the GI Bill of Rights uh, basically was a government program that said, hey, you served in our military, you fought bravely, you served to make our country free and make other countries free. We're gonna give you money so you can go back to school, so you can go to college, get your GED. You can buy a house, you can get a job. So we're, it's like a thank you to our military veterans. And that's what the GI Bill of Rights did. And any military veteran that had kids and children, they got money too because their parents served in the military. Another, sec another thing about this time period was that Harry Truman desegregated the armed forces. He did that in 1948. And here's, some, here's, a, newspaper, here's a newspaper headline that shows that. Here it shows black and white soldiers serving together. He did that by executive order. Um, that desegregate, he desegregated our armed forces. Another thing here, it says the civil rights legislation led to increase educational, economic, and political opportunities for women and minorities. So that was really pushed and advocated for because of World War II. All right, thank you for listening. Thanks and have a good day. Peace. Oops, we'll talk about this later.